Listening Practice Part 4 The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers The Muslim World Even the first of the European sailors to visit China in the early 16th century, although impressed by its size, population and riches, might have observed that this was a country which had turned in on itself. That remark certainly could not then have been made of the Ottoman Empire, which was then in the middle stages of its expansion and being nearer home, was corresponding much more threatening to Christendom. Viewed from the larger historical and geographical perspective, in fact it would be fair to claim that it was the Muslim states which formed the most rapidly expanding, expanding forces in the world affairs during the 16th century. Not only were the Ottoman Turks pushing westward, but the Safavid dynasty in Persia was also enjoying a resurgence of power, prosperity and high culture, especially in the reigns of Ismail I 1500-1524 and Abbas I 1587-1629. A chain of strong Muslim Khanates still controlled the ancient Silk Road via Kashgar and Turfan to China, not unlike the chain of the West African Islamic states such as Borno, Sakutu, and Timbuktu. The Hindu Empire in Java was overthrown by Muslim forces early in the 16th century, and the King of Kabul, Babur, entering India by the conquerors' routes from the Northwest established the Mongol Empire in 1526. Established the Mughal Empire in 1526. Although this hold on India was shaky at first, it was successfully consolidated by Babur's grandson Akbar, 1556 to 1605, who carved out Northern Indian Empire stretching from Balochistan in the west to Bengal in the east. Throughout the 17th century, Akbar's successors pushed farther south against the Hindu Marathas, just at the same time as the Dutch, British and French were entering the Indian peninsula from the sea, and of course in a much less substantial form. To these secular signs of Muslim growth, one must add the vast increase in number of the faithful in Africa and the Indies, against which the proselytization by Christian missions paled in comparison. But the greatest Muslim challenge to early modern Europe lay, of course, with the Ottoman Turks, or rather with their formidable army and the finest siege chain of the age. Already by the beginning of the 16th century, their domain stretched from this Crimea, where they had overrun Genoese trading posts in the Aegean where they were dismantling the Venetian Empire to the Levant. By 1516, Ottoman forces had seized Damascus and in the following year they entered Egypt, shattering Mamluk forces by the use of Turkish cannon. Having thus closed the spice, having thus closed the spice route from the ladies, they moved up the Nile and pushed through the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean, countering the Portuguese incursions there. If, the, if this perturbed Iberian sailors, it was nothing to the fright which the Turkish armies were giving the princes and peoples of Eastern and Southern Europe. Already the Turks held Bulgaria and Serbia and were the predominant influence in Wallachia and all around the Black Sea. But following the southern drive against Egypt and Arabia, the pressure against Europe was resumed under Suleiman 1520-1566. Hungary, the great eastern bastion of Christendom in these years, could no longer hold off the superior Turkish armies and was overrun following the Battle of Mohaix in 1526. The same year, coincidentally, as Babur gained the victory at Panipat by which the Mughal Empire was established, would all of Europe soon go the way of northern India, 
by 1529 with the Turks besieging Vienna this must have appeared a distinct possibility to some in actual fact the line then stabilized in northern Hungary and the Holy Roman Empire was preserved but thereafter the Turks presented a constant danger and exerted a military pressure which could never be fully ignored even as late as 1683 they were again besieging Vienna Almost as alarming in many ways was the expansion of Ottoman naval power like Kublai Khan in China the Turks had developed a navy only in order to reduce a sea girt enemy fortress in this case Constantinople the Sultan Mehmed blockaded with large galleys and hundreds of smaller craft to assist the assault of 1453 thereafter formidable galley f- fleets were used in operations across the Black Sea in the southward pushed towards Syria and Egypt and in a whole series of clashes with Venice the control of the Aegean island Rhodes Crete and Cyprus for some decades of the early 16th century Ottoman sea power was kept at arm's length by Venetian Venice and Habsburg fleets but by mid century muslim naval forces were active all the way along the north african coast were raiding ports in italy spain and balearics and finally managed to take cyprus in 1570s 1571 before being checked at the battle of lepanto the ottoman empire was of course much more than a military machine a conquering elite like the mankas in china the ottoman had established a unity of official faith culture and language over an area greater than the roman empire and over a vast number of subject peoples for centuries before 1500 the world of islam had been culturally and technologically ahead of europe the cities were large valid and trained and some of them possessed universities and libraries and stunningly beautiful mosques in mathematics cartography medicine and many other aspects of science and industry in mills gun casting and lighthouses horse breeding the muslims had enjoyed a lead the ottoman system of recruiting future janissaries from christian youth in the balkans had produced a dedicated uniform corps of troops tolerance of other races had brought many a talented greek jew and gentile into the sultan's service a hungarian was mehmed's chief gun caster in the siege of constantinople a successful leader like Suleiman I a strong bureaucracy supervised 14 million subjects this at a time when Spain had 5 million in England a mere 2 and a half million inhabitants Constantinople in its heyday was bigger than any European city possessing over 500,000 inhabitants in 1600 yet the Ottoman Turks too were to falter to turn inward and to lose the chance of world domination although this became clear only a century after the strikingly similar Ming decline to su- to a certain extent it could be argued that this process was the natural consequence of earlier Turkish successes the Ottoman army however well administered might be able to maintain the lengthy frontiers but could hardly expand farther without enormous cost in men and money and Ottoman imperialism unlike that of Spanish Dutch and English later did not bring much in the way of economic benefit by the second half of the 16th century the empire was showing signs of strategically over extension with a large army stationed in central europe an expressive an expensive navy operating in the mediterranean troops engaged in north africa the aegean cyprus and the red sea and reinforcements needed to hold the crimea against a rising russian power even in the near east there was no quiet flank thanks to a disastrous religious split in the muslim world which occurred when the shiites branch based in iraq and then in persia challenged the prevailing sunni practices and teachings at times the situation was not unlike that of contemporary religious struggles in germany and the sultan could maintain his dominance only by crushing shiites dissid- dissidents with force however across the border the shiites kingdom of persia under abbas the great was 
quite prepared to ally with European states against the Ottomans, just as France had worked with the infidel Turk against the Holy Roman Empire. With this array of adversaries, the Ottoman Empire would have needed remarkable leadership to have maintained this growth, but after 1566, there reigned 13 incompetent sultans in succession. External enemies and personal failings do not, however, provide the full explanation. The system as a whole, like that of Ming China, increasingly suffered from some of the defects of being centralized, despotic, and severely orthodox in its attitude toward initiative, dissent, and commerce. An idiot sultan could paralyze the Ottoman Empire in the way that a pope or holy Roman emperor could never do for all Europe. Without clear directives from above, the arteries of the bureaucracy hardened, preferring conservatism to change and stifling innovation, the lack of territorial expansion and accompanying booty after 1550, together with the vast rise in prices, caused discontented janissaries to turn to internal plunder, merchants and entrepreneurs, nearly all of whom were foreigners who earlier had been encouraged, now found themselves subject to unpredictable taxes and outright seizure of property. Ever higher dues ruined trade and depopulated towns. Perhaps worst affected of all were the peasants whose lands and stock were preyed upon by the soldiers. As the situation deteriorated, civilian officials also turned to the plunder, demanding bribes and confiscating stocks of goods. The cost of war and the loss of Asiatic trade during the struggle with Persia intensified the government's desperate search for new revenues, which in turn gave greater powers to unscrupulous tax farmers. To a distinct degree, the fierce response to the Sheikh's religious challenge reflected and anticipated a hardening of official attitudes toward all forms of free thought. The printing press was forbidden because it might disseminate dangerous opinions. Economic notions remained primitive. Imports of Western wares were desired, but exports were forbidden. The guilds were supported in their efforts to check innovation and the rise of capitalist producers, religious criticism of traders intensified, contemptuous of European ideas and practices, the Turks declined to adopt newer methods for containing plagues, consequently their population suffered more from severe epidemics. In one truly amazing fit of obscurantism, a force of Genesaries destroyed a state observatory in 1580 and uh, alleging that it had caused a plague. The armed services had become indeed a bastion of conservatism, despite notion and occasionally suffering from the newer weaponry of European forces. The Genesaries were slow to, the modernize, to modernize themselves. Their bulky cannons were not replaced by the lighter cast iron guns. After the defeat at Lepanto, they did not build the larger European type of vessels. In the south, the Muslim fleets were simply ordered to remain in the calmer waters of the Red Sea and Persian Gulf, thus obviating the need to construct ocean-going vessels on the Portuguese model. Perhaps technical reasons helped to explain these decisions, but cultural and technological conservatism also played a role. By contrast, the irregular Barbary corsairs swiftly adopted the frigate type of warship. The above remarks about conservatism could be made with equal or even greater force about the Mongol Empire. Despite the sheer size of the kingdom at its height, and the military genius of some of his imperials, despite the brilliance of his courts and the craftsmanship of its luxury products, despite even of sophisticated banking and credit network, the system was weak at the core. A conquering Muslim elite lay on top of a vast mass of poverty stricken peasants chiefly adhering to Hinduism. In the towns themselves, there were very considerable numbers of merchants bustling markets and an attitude toward manufacture, trade and credit among Hindu business families which would make them excellent examples of Weber's protestant 
ethic as against this picture of an entrepreneurial society just ready for economic takeoff before it became a victim of british imperialism there are the gloomier portrayal of the many in indigenous regarding retarding factors in indian life the sheer rigidity of hindu religious taboos militated militated against modernization rodents and insects could not be killed so vast amounts of food stuff were lost social mores about handling refuse and excreta led to permanently insanity conditions a breeding ground for babonic plagues the caste system throttled initiative instilled ritual and restricted the market and the influence wielded over indian local rulers by the brahman priests meant that this obscurantism was effective at the highest level here were social checks of the deepest sort to any attempt attempts at radical change small wonder small wonder that later many britons having first plundered and then tried to govern india in accordance with utilitarian principles finally left with the feeling that the country was still a mystery to them but the mogol rule could scarcely be compared with administration by the indian civil services service the brilliant courts were centers of conspicuous consumption on a scale which the sun king at versailles might have thought excessive thousands of servants and hangers on extravagant clothes and jewels and harems and menageries vast arrays of body gods could be paid for only by the creation of a systematic plunder machine tax collectors required to provide fixed sums for their masters preyed mercilessly upon peasants and merchants alike whatever the state of the harvest or trade the money had to come in there being no constitutional or other checks apart from rebellion upon such depredations it was not surprising that taxation was known as eating for this colossal annual tribute the population received next to nothing there was little improvement in communication and no machinery for assistance in the event of famine flood and plague which were of course fairly regular occurrences all this makes the ming dynasty appear benign almost progressive by comparison technically the mongol empire was to decline because it became increasingly difficult to maintain itself against the marathas in the south the afghanis in the north and finally the east india company in reality the causes of his decay were much more internal than external 